Hello, everyone. This is a special episode that you will be finding on one of many podcast feeds, and we would like to welcome you to a discussion about one of the Gauntlet's games and its upcoming crowdfunding campaign on Backerkit. If my voice is utterly unfamiliar to you, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Alex Rabitsky. I am a co-host over on one of the Gauntlet's other podcasts, The Darkened Threshold, and I am sitting down today with none other than Jason Cordova. Hello, Jason. Hello, Alex Rabitsky. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. This is a little weird because normally you and I are co-hosts yeah. and we like talk about things in equal measure and I'm interviewing you today. Yeah. So this is yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's a little strange. I'm trying to channel my inner third floor wars, you know, oh, Craig yeah, kind yeah. of interviewee. Yeah. Craig yeah, would yeah. like that name drop quite a lot. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, welcome. I'm happy to be sitting down. Today, we're going to be talking about a lot of details regarding not just the crowdfunding campaign for this game of yours, but also the game itself, which we normally do a lot of over on the Darkened Threshold. But since this is reaching all sorts of audiences, we're really going to dig into it still, you and I, especially for people who might not be familiar with it. Yeah. I want to start right out of the gate just to get it out of the way for anyone who might not be previously aware or might just want a refresher. Jason, what is The Between? So The Between is the game that we are bringing to Backerkit crowdfunding probably in a few days, September 24th, as of when this episode will drop. The Between is a game about monster hunters in Victorian era London. These characters are residents of a place in London called Hargrave House, and they do battle with monstrous threats in the city. These are often literal monsters, but they can also be serial killer and urban legend style enemies that they have to face. There is a criminal mastermind puppeteering everything in the background and Hargrave House will eventually have to face that person in order to stop them from enacting their grand empire destroying plans. The game is very much, well, is originally directly inspired by the TV show Penny Dreadful but it also takes a lot of inspiration from British horror classics like Frankenstein and The Picture of Dorian Gray, as well as graphic novels like From Hell and especially The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It's gothic horror. It has a sort of Powered by the Apocalypse mechanical chassis, much like Brindlewood Bay does, but it uses Brindlewood Bay's mystery system. It is very much a game that has been in conversation with Brindlewood Bay mechanically for years, and it's sort of our follow-up to Brindlewood Bay in a lot of ways. And so if you really love Brindlewood Bay, you're going to really, really love this. And let's talk about that mystery system a little bit more for a second, because this is arguably one of the things that Brenda Wood Bay was like sold the most on and very much still applies here in the between, as opposed to more traditional mystery solving experience in tabletop role playing games. There is no established solution out of the gate, correct? Yeah. In Brindlewood Bay, the idea was that you had these older women who are solving murder mysteries in their community. I'm sure by now most people listening know what Brenda Wood Bay is. And the Keeper, the GM in that game, the Keeper didn't know the solution to the murder mystery. They didn't know who did it. The players would be rolling dice, collecting clues, getting into danger and such. But eventually they'll come together, they'll put their clues together, and they'll have a conversation as players and try to deduce who they think the killer is based off the clues they have. And so there are no canonical solutions. It's really truly like what the players come up with at the table based off the clues they have. And that made Brindlewood Bay, you know, I would say very unique game in the at the time it came out. What The Between does is it expands this idea quite a bit. It still has this same fundamental way of doing investigations. You're collecting clues and you are trying to put together answers to what The Between calls questions. So we're expanding beyond who did the murder. And now we are looking at all kinds of different questions, such as how can we get this ghost to stop tormenting this family? This vampire that is in a child's body, is it actually a child or is it an ancient vampire in a child's body? That sort of thing. And so essentially it takes that idea of who did the murder and just applies it to all kinds of questions. And you do your clues, you come up with your solution, you roll some dice to see if you're correct, and then that unlocks an opportunity if you are correct. And the opportunity is then perform a banishing ritual to get rid of the ghost, lure the vampire to you, lure the serial killer to you, find out the lair of this werewolf or whatever. Yeah, and that's basically how it works. It takes 
that idea and expands it to be about all kinds of types of investigations. Well, I want to hit on something you just said, which you had described this a moment ago as a bit of a follow-up to Brenda Wood Bay. Yeah. And while technically true, you and I have talked about this before, and it's been mentioned in other circles, but technically the between came before Brindlewood Bay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Longtime followers of my work will know that I started working on The Between all the way back in late 2018. It's been a long time. When you say late 2018, it doesn't feel like it was a long time ago, but it absolutely was comparatively. It's six years ago. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's been a minute. So late 2018 is when I started working on The Between. I had never designed a game before. <laughs> so, and I didn't really have like a process, but I just knew I wanted to make the Penny Dreadful game, right? That was what I wanted to do. Now it's become much more in the years since, but that was my original impetus. And I ran into this situation where I had created all these awesome playbooks, and the playbooks in the between are amazing, if I do say so myself. All these really cool scenarios, this really great phases of play structure. I came up with all this stuff, mm -hmm. but I didn't have the mystery solving part of it figured out yet. And what I didn't want to do at that time was keep reinventing the wheel and having to change the playbooks and such over and over and over again until I got the mystery system figured out. Like that felt very inefficient. And so what I did was I wanted to create a smaller, quote, you know, smaller mystery game to just try out the mystery and investigation mechanics that I was sort of playing around with at that time. Mm -hmm. That's where Brindlewood Bay came from. I conceived of Brindlewood Bay as just a quick, fast game to try that out. Now, Brenda Wood Bay ended up being a big hit and people really loved it and it kind of took on a life of its own and it jumped the line, right? So Brenda Wood Bay jumped the line and got published first in 2020. And then about a year later was when The Between finally came out. But what's been really interesting is The Between and Brenda Wood Bay, they've been in conversation with each other in that entire time. You're correct. The Between was the first thing that I was working on. Brenda Wood Bay then happened. And then I used the learning of Brenda Wood Bay, like watching our community play it, watching people outside of the gauntlet play it, and learning things about it, and then incorporating that learning into The Between. And then we had The Between out in 2021. We took Brenda Wood Bay to crowdfunding in 2022. And the final edition of Brenda Wood Bay has a lot of stuff in it that we learned from watching The Between. These two games. They're so connected, like they are spiritual siblings in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They also, incidentally, take place in the same universe. <laughs> um, and so they are not really like super directly connected, but there are little tiny things that connect them and situate them in the same universe. But the more important thing is that mechanically, structurally, and just in terms of my thinking on games and game design, they are very, very connected. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I would like to talk a bit more about the mystery solving system, not necessarily as in-depth as we would go into it for people who've never heard about it, because at least... Please go listen to The Dark yeah, and Threshold. please go listen <laughs> yeah. to The Dark and Threshold. <laughs> yeah. Something that evolved out from Brenda Wood Bay, as you said, which did use just a kind of whodunit framework, and taking that and applying a more broad questions and answers type of approach to it, I find, and I'm curious to pick your brain about this, because I don't think we've actually talked about this as a specific subject very much, is how efficiently and appropriately, I would add, this strengthens the gothic horror genre and experience. Mm. Whereas, be, and let me let me peel back my thinking on that yeah, a little unpack, bit. Yeah, unpack that question I, for me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I'd, ha I'd be happy to. Uh, well, what I mean by that is chiefly you were inspired by Penny Dreadful and, yeah. and British horror classics. And a lot of those focus on the characters, their emotional experiences, yes. their perspectives. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the actual engagement with the forces of darkness or what have you, it's not a situation where you are dealing with, I hit the monster or, you know, how, yeah. you know, I, I deal X amount of damage to the monster. The focus in those books, and especially in Penny Dreadful, is the creeping mystery leading up to the climactic confrontation. Yeah. And the mechanics of the between specifically with these playbooks uh, is one where the investigation of these questions and gathering clues for them is directly feeding into the overall ambient theme. Yeah. And I feel like it's feeding back into like the gothic melodrama of it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I do. Yeah. It's interesting. I can't say I've ever thought about it in those terms, but I think that's a really, really good insight. This is a game about characters. 
Brindlewood Bay, for one thing, uses a character sheet rather than playbooks, meaning that the characters are all similar to each other. They are all little old women who like mystery books. So the focus is in truly, truly on the mystery of it, in addition to the sort of occult mystery behind all of it. But the murder mysteries are like really focused in Brindlewood Bay. That's the focus of it. But I would say that the between, and I think this is kind of what you're speaking to, the between is very, very character focused. The playbooks are... These are much deeper character treatments than we got in Brindlewood Bay. And a lot of what's coming out in those playbooks are themes. Some people can take or leave the idea of themes and thematic roleplay, but I love theme in roleplaying games. And what I think is interesting is as you're exploring these characters, as you're trying to figure out how your vessel, that's one of the playbooks, how your vessel became a sort of funnel for occult power or how your American got stricken with lycanthropy or as you're examining your characters in that way, you're also informing the world a little bit. And that feeds into how you answer the questions. And it truly is a very collaborative process, but sometimes that collaborative process operates on a slightly subconscious level or, yeah, but I think that's the beauty of it. And you're right that it does tend to make the story and the solutions quite dramatic and quite melodramatic, right? Which is really important in the gothic horror genre. It becomes less forensic, though it can be quite forensic, Mm -hmm. and becomes much more about big ideas and big emotion and gut-wrenching horror and a group of people at Hargrave House who are just barely keeping it together. And they're even starting to question why they're even doing this work. And they're at each other's throats at some point. They're starting to question what they're even doing. They might even start to sympathize with the monsters a little bit. Like it starts to become this really dramatic, not a really cut and dry thing. You know, it's just not. And so that's an interesting insight. I had never really thought about it in terms of the genre, but I think you're right. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that it's a very, very character focused game. Yes, we've talked a lot about genre emulation as like a key focus of these games over on the Darkened Threshold. And I do want to talk a bit more about these playbooks specifically, just for people who might not be familiar with what the Between as a base offers in terms of these character archetypes. But it is very much overall an experience rooted in character drama and and specifically Mm -hmm. melodrama as we've both said if you just watched the first three episodes of penny dreadful you're gonna get the entire game scope you're locked and and loaded you're you're locked in you're ready for the between yeah absolutely but again comparing and contrasting to brenda wood bay and i know that they've been in conversation with one another but it's still a fascinating insight into not just your game design headspace but also how the community has influenced it and how these small changes overall affect the entire experience. If you take a clue in Brindlewood Bay, a standard whodunit mystery, just trying to figure out who the murder is, they're pretty simple clues. They usually follow some bit of either forensic or tangible evidence that can help point people in the direction of which of these people Something did the Something that thing. speaks to motive or whatever, yeah. yeah. Ex- like a receipt with yeah. purchases or whatever. Yeah. But when you take the questions and answer structure that the Between utilized, which broadens that a lot, you're really digging into questions that might be not so so easily structured with simple clues. Like, again, using the ghost example of, like, how can we get this ghost to move on? You have a lot of runway where you need to expand not just the player thinking, but how the keeper gets to present these clues in the world. So you get clues in the between that are sometimes very strange, kind of weird. but other yeah. times hyper-specific, yeah. like more so than you would find in, in Brindlewood Bay. I can't remember a specific one, but it, it, to the effect of the Brindlewood Bay clue looks like you find uh, letters about some sort of salacious affair, whereas in the between, you'd like, oh, all the mirrors are cracked in a spiral pattern. <laughs> right, yeah. <You> know? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But it is in conversation with itself mm-hmm. where you have these characters, these playbooks that are taken directly from archetypes you find in British horror fiction, especially Penny Dreadful, of which in the original game, there are six, the American, the Undeniable, the Explorer, the Factotum, the Vessel, and the Mother. Six plus one, because the Orphan as well. Oh, that that is correct. The Orphan. I always, I do tend to forget about that one. We've talked about each of these playbooks in our respective episodes of The Darkened Threshold. 
for people who are not familiar, in brief, can you run us through what each of these playbooks are and their chief inspiration from gothic horror? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So in the beginning of your question, you said I started with Penny Dreadful, but then the community has helped Mm -hmm. shape where the game has gone. And that's really, really a really good point. I hope we talk about it more in a bit. But the core playbooks, which can be found in the core book that we're going to be crowdfunding, you have the American, who is a cowboy type who has run off to London because back home they got a lycanthropy curse and they did something really terrible because of it and now they're on the run and that's inspired pretty directly from spoiler alert for Penny Dreadful pretty directly from (laughs) Josh Hartnett's character in Penny Dreadful then you have the vessel who is a magic user a witch or sorcerer of some sort who allows dark entities to come inside their body, um, to enter their body and give them their power. And that is inspired most directly by Ava Green's character in Penny Dreadful. We have the explorer who is a lion of British nobility, this person who has a mountain range named after them, there to defend queen and country, very rich and very powerful in the setting. But they also have a really dark past that they're going to have to contend with. And that's inspired by loads of characters in fiction from the period. But from in Penny Dreadful terms, it's uh, Timothy Dalton's character. We have the Factotum, which is a English valet or governess type character who is a little more invisible than the other characters. They sort of hang back a little bit, but they are very effective at what they do. They manage the household and they're really, really good at getting information. And they have another character at at the table who they're very connected to, who's their employer. And they get a lot of bonuses when they are in defense of that person. I guess there is a factotum equivalent in... Penny Dreadful, I find that character to be somewhat problematic, and so I've modeled my factotum off of a more classic governess English valet-type character that you can find in all kinds of fiction. And then we have the mother, who is building a person in a secret place in Hargrave House, Dr. Frankenstein style. Yeah, I wonder who that's inspired by, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So we have a Dr. Frankenstein-style character. And then the Undeniable is a Dorian Gray-style character, except in the between, they are times 10. They are a character who is so magnetic, so charismatic, so beautiful that people just fall on their knees to do whatever this person wants. They're almost like godlike in their ability to influence people. They are so young and charismatic and beautiful because there is an artistic work hidden somewhere in the city that is taking on the stains of their soul. The Undeniable's also kind of a villainous character as compared to the other playbooks, but loads of fun to play. And then there's the orphan, which is attached to the mother attached playbook. Attached to the mother, yeah. The yeah. orphan is not immediately available in play, but there is a chance when you are playing the mother that if you try to bring your creation to life, that they turn on you mm-hmm. <laughs> so or that you abandon them yeah. and different things happen. One of the things that can happen is you can have this new character that enters Hargrave House who is the orphan, who is trying to find meaning because they are a new construct. They have no history of their own. They're trying to find meaning and family. Yeah, yeah. Those are the core playbooks. There are, I suspect in the crowdfunding, we're going to have many, many more that we'll have available as far as unlocking them as achievements go. That's what they call stretch goals and backer kid as achievements. But yeah, th- that core group is very much inspired by characters in Penny Dreadful, but also because in Penny Dreadful, they were also inspired by, by British horror classics. You can see the connections there as well. So that makes up the cast of characters of Hargrave House and While we mentioned that you're solving mysteries with these questions and opportunities, let's actually explore that a little further with the actual gameplay cycle, the scope of the between. Like, what exactly happens in this game? You have these characters, and they're getting clues, they're answering questions, but what is the framework around it? Because in in Brindlewood Bay, you have one mystery at a time, and in in that mystery, you're just trying to figure out who did the murder, who is the murderer, and then you save the day. Extremely simple and satisfying for the genre it's emulating. But London is a very big city. Yes. So let's talk about the scope and gameplay procedure therein. Yes, you've got your playbooks. You've got your hunter. 
And the gameplay is structured in phases. So you have the day phase and you have a night phase. Those are the two main phases of play. There's also two interstitial phases, dusk and dawn. But day and night are the two main gameplay phases. The day phase is very much like a typical role-playing game. The characters wander about the city or whatever they want to do, have scenes with each other, and try to figure out what's going on with these various monstrous threats. Every day phase, you introduce a brand new threat until you get up to three. So you can have up to three threats at one time that Hargrave House are having to deal with. And unlike Brindlewood Bay, London is a much bigger, much more dangerous place. And so Hargrave House is dealing with a lot more at any given time. Furthermore, some of the playbooks have their own dark pasts that are catching up to them, and those dark pasts might take the form of threats that Hargrave House has to deal with, in which case they can be added atop the threats that are already there. And so you can have four threats active because the vessel's being hounded by this coven of witches, and so the coven of witches has arrived in London, now we have this one to deal with. The pressure is always really high, these threats are piling up. And Hargrave House very quickly finds itself having to make decisions about what to focus on and how to tackle these problems. And the threats, the longer they are left unattended, the more problems they cause in the city. And eventually they might even turn their eye to Hargrave House itself and start to become a direct threat to Hargrave House. And so that's how that piles up. Now, the day phase, it's a more... I don't want to say relaxed. That's not the right way of putting it. Lackadaisical. Yeah, I don't think that's quite right. Because yeah. Especially once all the, the threats start piling up. No, I think it's no, more just good, the, yeah. the keeper follows the players. It's more leisurely. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more leisurely. Like the players decide what they want to do and the keeper follows them around. And sometimes the hunters wander into really dangerous situations and that's great. But sometimes the characters might decide they want to just talk about what's been going on. They can't say too much because the characters and players are not allowed to talk about their pasts too much. Which That's a big thing we're going to explore should talk about. here in a yeah. second. Yeah, we should. Yeah, But they might decide they want to have an intimate scene with another character just to unburden themselves, which is very on genre. And so that's sort of what the day phase is like. But then you have the night phase. The night phase is quicker. And the night phase is much more dangerous. The night phase, the die rolls are a little tougher <laughs> on Hargrave House. The action is a lot more intense. Yeah, I like to say that it's like fast and feral. That's what the night phase is. And I don't know how much we want to go into it right now, but the night phase has this thing hovering over it called the unseen. And the unseen is a scene that's taking place in another part of the city on the same night as whatever the hunters are doing. Now, this unseen has no connection to what the hunters are doing directly. It's more of a thematic connection. We get to see another part of the city making London a character in the story. That unseen is happening on the same night as the hunters are doing what they're doing. Once the unseen is over, that means the night phase is also over. As compared to the day phase, the night phase is much more intense. It's much more dangerous. And also, it really shows London at night. And this phase structure is not something that existed in Brindlewood Bay, no. which was a more, it took a more like narrative approach to like whatever yeah, made just, sense yeah, in, in the time, story. Time, it's nighttime, it's nighttime, and we don't worry too much about it, you know? And in the between, this phase structure exists primarily because one of the game's biggest goals is to create a cinematic experience, yes. to have something that is very structured. And guided to keep the flow of the story moving while also having a heavy emphasis on providing a really rich story that's arising out of this narrative. Yeah. I think that the night phase specifically being so timed is a, one, a great design choice on your part. Thank you. Mostly the big reason why I find it so successful is because in its cinematic inspiration in television like Penny Dreadful is the night is dangerous. And this is a thing that is in Brenda Wood Bay. The night is more dangerous and that's why there's moves associated with it but it's not just about the danger level it's about the pacing it's about the literal framing of the story when you're in it, it it's quick it's rapid and then it's over and we get back to the more simmering character drama that happens during the daylight hours now going back to what we were just saying with character backstory because this is a, a delicious detail 
when I first started playing the between, it wasn't a hard sell for me, but it was a thing I was actively nervous about yeah. because I wasn't sure that the people I was playing with at the time would find it fun. And I was very happy to find myself wrong and that it was a huge hit. So if you're unaware, in the between, it is mechanically restricting you in any capacity from talking about your character's backstory not just in character or during the game also out of character that's a real sticker yeah. yes yeah. you as a player cannot talk about your backstory with any of your fellow players or even the gm now i hear you asking how does that work if you are familiar with Brindlewood Bay, one of its main mechanics outside of the mystery solving system were the crowns. The crowns, the queen, the crowns, the void, effectively acting as a sort of timer for your character's presence in the story. You don't have hit points. You don't necessarily have a means of dying as some more traditional games present. You have a series of prompts that allow you to influence the story as you want to tell it. But once you're out of them, your character's out of the story. In Brindlewood Bay, that looked like exploring your character's past and, and her womanhood and also how the descent into the investigation was affecting you. It is a little different, though still the same here in the between. Now, Jason, here you call these masks, yeah, the Janus mask. Janus mask. Now, if there's anyone who is not necessarily familiar with the mythology that this is rooted in, Jason, can you please explain the meaning behind the Janus mask and why you went with that. Yeah, for one thing, it's kind of a tangential thing, but the Brindleverse, such as it is, is very <laughs> concerned with my interpretation of Greek and Roman mythology. Brindlewood Bay, of course, very famously focuses on the underworld in terms of its occult aspects. The Between is kind of a similar thing. Janus is a Roman god, actually, there's not a Greek equivalent, but a Roman god of passageways, portals, gates, beginnings and ends, transitions. And the god is frequently depicted as having two faces, one looking to the past and one looking to the future. In the game, the Janus mask mechanic is broken up into two pieces on the playbook sheet, the mask of the past and the mask of the future. What you're essentially doing in a metaphorical sense is you are looking with Janice's past face when you flash back to the past and you are looking to Janice's future face when you look into the future. The idea here is that the mask of the past has seven prompts that when narrated in order, tell the backstory of your character leading up to the moment when they joined Hargrave house. The mask of the future is kind of the same for all the characters each prompt on the Mask of the Future is named after a particular portal or gate, going to the Janus idea, and they indicate possibilities, a possible dark future that your character might embrace or go toward, with the final one being, or the presumed final one being, the blood-soaked portal where your character is physically destroyed. It's a sort of metaphor for transitions and mm -hmm. gateways and beginnings and ends and that kind of thing. Well, it's also a structure around which a given player can explore the narrative of an archetype. Yeah. Because you have these backstory prompts. And in Brindlewood Bay, everyone shared the same character sheet. So they were all kind of the same flashback prompts for broad strokes of womanhood. Mm -hmm. But here, these are like specific to the playbook, yes, exploring yeah. like a story that led up to them, mm -hmm. you know, joining Hargrave House. Now, you're not allowed to talk about this, though. So how does that work? Where does this come in? I would say in the development of The Between, I've had three big mechanical light bulb moments, coup de gras, if you will. One is the actual investigation system itself. The other is the unseen, which I mentioned briefly earlier. And I think this is the other one. Mm. There is almost no other role-playing game I can think of where you are discouraged, indeed not allowed, to talk about your character's past in or out of character. The reason why the between works that way is we want these characters to remain mysterious. We don't even start with them when they first get to Hargrave House. They've already been at Hargrave House for a while by the time we join them. They know each other, but they don't know anything about each other. We don't even explore the how or why of Hargrave House. Well, put a pin in that because when we talk about Shadow yeah. Society, we might talk about that more. But for now, 
we don't really even know like who owns Hargrave House, who runs it, who funds it. These characters just end up there and they just are doing this work. Through the flashbacks of The Mask of the Past, we might learn some of those things. And we're definitely going to learn how those characters got at Hargrave House, but we're going to do it in a cinematic way. So whenever your character is, you're doing a die roll, we set stakes, and the stakes are, if this die roll goes poorly, my character is going to be violently disemboweled by the vampire, or the ghost is going to possess me and pull out my soul, or something like that. The character's going to be dead, say. I roll some dice, the die roll goes really badly, the keeper then narrates the terrible thing, <laughs> they narrate my character being brutally killed, but then I say no. I'm going to look through the mask of the past, and... I mark the next box that needs to be marked. I then narrate this flashback showing my character's past a little bit. And then in exchange for that, I get to have my die roll bumped up so that I'm not killed. And that's the deal. So what we get is we have not known anything about this character's past, but when we do learn about it, it's at the most dramatically interesting moment. We learn about their past at the most heightened moment it can happen. <laughs> and that is very cinematic because if you think about it, this is often how TV shows go. Like in a TV show, like a prestige TV show or something, we don't learn everything about the characters on episode one. It's doled out at really dramatically interesting points throughout the season. And that's the same thing here. There's another way that you can learn about a character's past, which is not through the Janus mask, which is having an intimate scene with another character. This is called the vulnerable move. And when you have this intimate, private scene with another character, you're allowed to talk a little more openly about your past. There again, though, we're learning about that past in the fiction, in the narrative, in the moment, when it's dramatically interesting, in this case, when two characters are opening up to each other. The whole philosophy behind it is... I love backstory. I love character backstory. I think it's great. It's one of my favorite parts of role-playing games. And I think it's even better when it's revealed in play at dramatically interesting times. You know, this is actually something that I find interesting about the game. There are a few things here I want to peel apart before we talk about some other aspects. But when it comes to the game at large, there is this general embracing of meta knowledge for the sake of like dramatic irony yes. of like, yeah, we the players can know things that the characters don't. And that's fine. Like you can be familiar with the ins and outs of any scenario. You can play through it multiple times and have a different experience each of those times. But the idea is that your characters are getting to deal things in the narrative while you, the player, may know things that are at their expense or setting things up. It's the sense of in a horror movie when the character says, I'll be right back. Yeah, but you, the yeah. player, are like, they're not going to be right back. No. But this is the one instance of the game where it's like, no. You yeah. do not get the yeah. dramatic irony or meta knowledge here. Like, you do not. You do not get to set that up. You are going to only do it when the mechanics tell you to do so. And this is something I find interesting, especially for perhaps people who might come from a more traditional, sure, dare I yeah. even say OSR kind of bend, where there is an encouragement on the character side to really not have that much of a backstory because you're probably going to be disposable anyway, and mm -hmm. having a character's story and background emerge from the play and while structured here do you still find that like largely it is approachable to people who want to have something rise out of the narrative without necessarily needing to bring anything to the table i think you get the best of both worlds honestly i've run this game so many times and i've seen different people handle it in different ways there's a version of this where you have a player which i think is probably like the experience of most role players traditionally where they think of their backstory ahead of time and they want to share it with you as the gm before play starts and that player sometimes has an issue with the not being able to share it part right away but the game absolutely is there for them in the think of your backstory part because the masks of the past especially act as a, essentially like an outline for your character yeah you are invited in between sessions to read it to think about it and to come up with your backstory you just can't share it right away on the other side of it, this idea of we come to the table with nothing and the story is just whatever happens at the table, well, you can get a bit of that too. 
Because you're not allowed to immediately talk about your backstory, it also means you have the freedom to change your own preconceived ideas of your backstory, or if you had no ideas, to be informed of your backstory. There's still space to do it. But when the time comes to actually talk about it, it has to be through the Janus mask or through a vulnerable move. And so I think you get both. I think there's room for both types yeah. of players. I will say that my personal favorite approach is when, like our friend Wes or Mads does, or you in our Silt versus game, in between sessions, they actually script out their Mask of the Past. I yeah. love that. Oh, yeah, it's a great approach. I love yeah. it when the players script out their Mask of the Past, or at least like think really hard about what they're going to say, and they come to the table ready to do it, because those are always the best moments at the table, because we all just get to sit back and be audience members, and it's really fun. That is absolutely like the thing I would want to signpost to people out there who are discovering the between and are like, oh, I love writing my character backstory and sharing it with my friends, and I'm kind of bummed that I'm limited. I say, hold on, because I promise you what you are doing here for this game specifically, no shade to other ones, is you are being guaranteed the runway to have everyone listening and paying attention at the most interesting moment when that character would shine. Both approaches are great. Yeah, I take a mixed approach myself as a player because sometimes I just want to see what comes in the moment. I come up with something. Other times I'm like, I know what I'm doing here. I'm scripting it in advance. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's really a fun way to explore these characters. We've talked before about the archetypes not as a limiting thing, but rather as a way to guide yes. creativity. Yeah. Because even though that these characters are specifically based on previous established character archetypes from the fiction and inspiration, they're not telling you you are this every time. There's a lot of flexibility here. So that is really welcoming to whatever approach you want to take in these games. It's a really good point. If I could just jump in real quick. Please. Uh, sometimes a, I don't know if it's a criticism, I think it's just mo- mostly a misunderstanding about the between, mm. is that because the mask of the past has a beginning, a middle, and an end with certain things that definitely happen for that character, that is limiting, like you're constricted. Yes, the American is always a rich kid who runs away from home, goes out west, gets struck with a lycanthropy curse hurts someone by accident and then comes to London. That happens for every American. But the way I look at it is, yes, there's not a lot of width there. You're on this one particular narrative track, but there is a lot of space to go deep with it. When you know the beginning and the middle and the end, you know the basic through line of your character's backstory. You have room to go really, really deep with it, to really explore certain emotions or to explore these prompts from angles that no one saw coming. Anybody who's been following my work in role-playing games long enough knows that this is my thing. I'm a big believer. I've called it different things in the past. I've called it the corridor. We start at one end of the corridor and we end up at the other end of the corridor. That's definitely happening. But along the way, there might be doors we can open and go into different places that no one saw. I'm a big believer in this style of role-playing game and storytelling. Yeah. You've said that before, is deep, not wide, and I think that's probably the best description for it. When you look at a lot of PBTA games from the past decade, and then some, there is this general consensus, and one that we still very much hold with these games, it's the play to find out. Yeah. There is a lot of to be discovered in play, but with the between in particular, there's a lot for you to bring to the table beforehand yeah. and not feel like a fish out of water. Yeah. Before... I start talking a little bit more about the unseen since we touched on that briefly and I do want to talk about it more. There's something that I just now thought of with the night phase particularly that I think is interesting. With the night phase, this is in the game's text. This is uh, mentioned that the day phase is the domain of the players. Mm -hmm. The night phase is the domain of the keeper, what Mm -hmm. we call the GM. And what that means is the keeper has the exclusive rights to say... This is what's happening, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, because the the players all describe what they want their characters to do, but the keeper has final say of whether that actually happens. And this is probably, if I were to phrase it this way, the type of adversarial GMing I actually love. And because it doesn't actually ruin player fun, and it also enhances, I feel like, what the game is going for thematically and genre-wise. I think that's right, yeah. It would be less so if the players didn't declare what they were doing in advance. Every time I've run the game, especially for new players, it's like, 
all right, you're all going to describe for me now. Per <laughs> the, the night game's face text, belongs to me. This yeah. is my yeah, yeah. belongs to me. I have the rights to say no, and I was fascinated by that at first, and I never had like bad feelings about it. But I think it is probably the healthiest way to have an air quotes adversarial type of experience with the yeah. the facilitator of the game without it being like a detriment to the overall experience you know what i mean by that yeah. it's it's very much yeah. like a case where you the players are going to set things up but i the master of <laughs> the story this in this moment. specific yeah. phase am going to thumb the scales and really lean on it the reason I bring this up specifically is because that play to find out methodology from the past decade and then some of these games is that a lot of it is play to find out what happens and keeper reactions and things are happening in conversation with one another. And this is a situation where explicitly you are told, no, do whatever you want mm -hmm. for the sake of your own creativity. I brought this up just because I think that's a really fun and often under discussed aspect it really of the game. Is. Yeah. Of the way it emphasizes the keeper's role in the story. I just, what are your thoughts on that? I can't say I've ever thought about it in those terms, but I think you're right. I have always considered myself a GM's game designer. And before that, I was a GM's podcaster. I'm still that. Um, I'm a big believer in the role of the GM at the table. I've had great fun with GMless games and other non traditional role playing game structures, but I really, really love the one GM, three to four players set up at the table. I just love it. I don't love the adversarial relationship, the negative, toxic kind of adversarial relationship. I think that's bad. But there is fun to be found when the keeper is being adversarial in a way that celebrates the characters. Does that make sense? Yes. And you see it in almost every part of the game. And I think the reason why it works in the between, and in Riddlewood Bay for that matter, but, but definitely in the between, I think the reason why it works is because at many other points in the game, the game is signaling to players that this is a collaborative process. Sometimes the keeper gets a little more say, but you still get a say. You can see it in the paint the scene question, which we've talked about on both podcasts a million times. That is an explicit invitation to the players to say, tell me what this looks like, what this feels like, what it sounds like, and then I'm going to reincorporate that. You can see it in just the setup of the mysteries. There's often questions that the keeper poses to the players so that they can get some buy-in to the mystery by saying what they think is going on right away. There's just the mystery solving itself. The players are largely in control of the answer. Or the day-night move. The basic conflict resolution move is a little mini negotiation between the keeper and the players. The players get to say what they're scared is going to happen if they fail. At every point throughout the game, the players are getting a say. It's not like the keeper is exclusively saying what is what. The players are always getting a chance to say what's going on. And they have ultimate control over whether their character even dies because of the Janus mask. As long as they have Janus mask available, they literally can't die. We can see them die, though. The keeper can narrate their death before the Janus mask gets put on. And that, again, goes to this playful adversarialness. It's this playful approach where, as the keeper, I'm going to narrate something really, really horrible, knowing knowing that you're going to escape it. But I'm still going to narrate it. And that's fun, right? Yeah. Fun. It's fun. The thing that kicked off this part of the conversation, this <laughs> idea of the night phase belongs to the keeper, it's in that spirit. Mm -hmm. It's in the spirit of... Yes, yes, yes. You've had your fun. We followed you around the day phase. I've asked you questions. I've let you do the world building with me. But this little 30 minute segment of play is where I get to have my fun and I get to say what I want to do. And I've taken on board your, your thoughts about what you want to do. But this is what London is doing tonight. And you don't have any choice but to react to it. And so that's what it is. The between, I think, certainly the most of all my games and probably of most role playing games that I've ever played, does such a good job of balancing player and keeper agency so that whenever the keeper does get to be kind of mean and nasty, the players love it. They want more. The reason I front loaded with that conversation about that aspect of it is because in talking about the unseen, it, quite literally going off of what you just said, the unseen is very much still in the player's court. The keeper is dictating almost entirely what they want to have happen in the night with the caveat that the players have a massive narrative undertaking that they get to share unrelated to their experiences. So you mentioned the unseen, which 
for the sake of the audio medium we're discussing this in, it is a, a pun. It's it a is U N S C E N E, unseen. Yeah. Right. And it's unrelated to the plot as it relates to Hargrave House. It just explores London. We've talked about this on The Darkened Threshold. It is a means of exploring and expanding the setting. Again, deeper, not necessarily wider, but it does make London feel like a character, which yeah. is very important. Where did the Unseen come from as a game designer? You've reincorporated it into other several games. of the other yeah. games since, yeah. but this is where it first appeared. So what was the origin and I guess overall driving desire behind, I want to do something that's kind of weird, but I think strengthens the game? Thank you. It was one of the very first things I wrote for The Between from a design standpoint. I knew immediately when I began the design process that London has to be a character in the story. It is so, so important that London does not get forgotten. I have played so many role-playing games and run so many role-playing games even where aspects of the setting get forgotten or they become secondary to what the player characters are doing. And maybe that's okay. But if you're playing a game set in a really rich, established universe Part of the reason why you're playing that game is because you want to experience that universe. You want to experience that setting. And so that was sort of what the Unseen was a nod to. We are playing a game set in the most cosmopolitan city of the time. It was the center of the world, essentially, in Victorian times, as certainly the center of the British Empire. And there was so much stuff going on. It's a city that is caught in the middle of old antiquated beliefs about spirituality, about science, about all kinds of stuff like that, and the industrial age. It's a city at this time that is so, so, so interesting and cool. And I knew immediately the city of London has to be a character in the game. There's got to be a way of doing it. And so then I began thinking about The Between as a cinematic style game, which is another thing I knew I wanted to do. And I began thinking, well, how does that usually go in TV shows? Well, in TV shows, they'll often do a thing where you see some character who's not named doing something somewhere, and during the course of the episode, we revisit that character. We don't know why, but at the end of the episode, we see why, because something that they're doing is connected to what's going on with the main characters. It's very, very cinematic, very art house approach. Prestige television. Yeah. And so that was where it came from. I had this idea that, yes, we're going to have this scene the unseen it was originally called the overseen oh yeah and then it was called the underseen i don't know why <laughs> um <laughs> and then it became the unseen because it's a fun play on words it is yeah an unseen in the sense that it's not it's a scene that has no bearing on the story it's just a sort of separate thing but also it is characters who are unseen because they are in a part of london that's little seen that was where it came from from a design standpoint it was one of the very first things i did yeah i like it specifically it's four prompts and then that you know the players take turns with it and there are other mechanics in the game that influence it sometimes there is a move that the mother has that if they if they take it it effectively allows them to have the opportunity to yeah. control the entire unseen themselves because it removes them from the narrative but it is this really fun tool at the table and for something that does not have a connection to the overall story happening with the hunters it doesn't feel like it's subtracting anything from the flow of the narrative it feels mm -hmm. like it's, it's actually enhanced the setting around the characters. We've talked a lot about the between what it is and what its mechanics are and what the cycle of play looks like. But before we talk about what it's doing on crowdfunding and all of the details they're in, I'm circling back to something we touched on earlier, which was the conversation with the community and how it's influenced itself. Um, the one note I will add before we get to that, though, is the thought occurs to me that most Powered by the Apocalypse games, at least in my awareness, have a mechanic in them for the sake of character experience when you miss or when you roll effectively Some of the a games failure, do, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you, you roll low. Some of the games do, you get character experience. That's not what you have here. Character experience in these games is entirely whether you solve situations or specific role playing prompts. But with the Unseen, yeah. there's also a thing called Echoes in the Night. And I actually wanted to ask you really quickly. When it comes to the way that characters advance and the way they specifically gather XP, you're very specific with the overall tone of what gives a character XP, which is the character and the themes that the setting is soaked with. 
the echoes in the night yeah. could you just explain that and i feel like you've already talked about the ethos behind it's the same as like what the unseen adds to play but i am curious about like overall your headspace on when you added that well the unseen to give an example one of the unseens that you might do shows this young woman getting a tarot card reading this young woman mm-hmm. we will never meet this character again we will probably never meet the tarot card reader again it has no direct connection to what's going on in Hargrave House, but it can have thematic connections. It can have visual connections. It can have connections that are more ephemeral. For example, maybe there's another unseen about a sex worker dying of consumption, classic Victorian era sort of thing. Maybe in the unseen, the player describes that person dying of consumption coughing blood into a bowl. And then in the hunter scene that immediately follows, a player describes their hunter, they notice a bowl of beautiful red flowers. That would be an echo in the night. The echo of the red in the bowl would be an echo in the night. Yeah, visuals, themes. Themes. Well, a thematic connection might be maybe the hunter just goes and visits a sex worker, right? (laughs) And so that would be a good thematic connection. Yeah. But in any case, the idea here, though, is... While the Unseen has no connection to the story that the Hunters are doing, it can very much connect to the vibes of what the Hunters are doing. Yes. And then that, in turn, just helps further flesh out the world and our version of London. Yeah. And we reward that with experience points, yeah. So if you do that during the night phase, if you make one of those connections like that, then you get an experience point. And for me, experience points, the way the Between uses them at least, it's all about encouraging certain types of role play, essentially. It's not your characters getting better in that sense of advancement. It's more just... It connects you with the setting and the themes, yeah. Your role playing your character in a certain way and that's fun and we're having a really great time here's xp (laughs) so Mm -hmm. yeah it explicitly rewards role playing and leaning into the genre you're in to be clear you do get experience for just the basic answering questions and solving mysteries like you do get experience for that but you also get quite a lot of experience for just good role playing as well yeah so if you're a role player and you specifically love to explore the characters then you are mechanically rewarded by it so We've talked about what the between is, what you do in the game, and it's been out since 2020, I believe you said, or 2021? 2021. 2021. Yeah. It's been three, almost four years of this game existing in the world. Very nearly four years. Yeah, it's been a bit. Yeah. And it's now coming to Backer Kit mm-hmm. on September 24th. And let's talk about that now. Why now? Why now? The specific why now is because we're nearly done fulfilling Brindlewood Bay. <laughs> so uh, that's, wh- that's yeah, why now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> setting that aside, <laughs> with our publications, we saw this with Trophy. Mm-hmm. We saw it with Brindlewood Bay and now with The Between. And we're going to see it with Public Access, Soul Versus, and Pizza Time, etc. I have always liked the approach where we release a game in a digital format, strictly digital format, first. A game that is, I would say, 90% done. It's totally playable. Maybe not perfect, but it's totally playable. We release it. We build up community around it. We get people to play it. And we have a good time with it. But also, me as the game designer, or us as a design team we get to see what's working and what's not working. And this is what I meant when I said talking about how the community has influenced it and vice versa, because it's existed in its online space for so long that there's been a lot of conversation around it. The Between is coming to crowdfunding with what I believe is a very, very dedicated play (laughs) community behind it. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's the gauntlet, but a lot of it is also people beyond the gauntlet. The game has been in this digital forum for a few years. We've had time to see what people love, what's working. I myself have run the game a lot in those three years. I've been able to see directly what I like and what I don't like. What we now get to do with this crowdfunded version of the game is, one, we get to put it in a physical form, which people have been asking for for three years. And two, we get to make the ultimate version of the between, the between that benefits from all of this player community, all of this third-party content, all this homebrewed content, all of this extra content that we've put out in the years since, because we didn't just stop with the game release in 2021. We've been releasing stuff for it ever since. It benefits from all that stuff, and we're going to put all of that learning and all that understanding to make what I consider to be the true, ultimate, best edition of the between we don't number our games first edition second edition it's not something we do we just do digital release and then physical release yeah but 
functionally, it's kind of a second edition. It's actually a little closer to what Mothership did. They yes. called their original edition Zeroth Edition. That's kind of what we were doing, right? Yeah. Like this, mm-hmm. this hardcover edition we're doing is the true first edition. But that's why now we are ready to take the between to the next level. And this is obviously my business. It's We have a lot of stakeholders in this business. A lot of people are dependent on the between doing well, and we're going to hopefully raise a lot of money, and that's awesome. But Really, what's going on is I fucking love the between and I want the best version of the between. And so this is it. This is our chance to really do the coolest possible thing with it. And indeed, to make it the best it can be. I am very happy that this has always been our approach, at least since Trophy, because I'm a big believer in being as thoughtful as possible in our design and our marketing and not doing things just because we could have taken trophy in Brindlewood Bay straight to crowdfunding. But instead, we gave those games a chance to breathe. We gave them a chance to find their players and their audience. We gave us a chance to learn about the games even more so that when we finally do the big ask in crowdfunding, we can feel confident that we're giving backers our best selves and our best version of the game. And I hope backers realize that we don't do anything lightly when it comes to crowdfunding. We wait until we're ready. (laughs) We really want to make sure that the package product we would want to receive. Yeah. So let's talk about what is going to be funded. What is the best version of the between? What does it look like? What are we doing? Yeah. Okay. We're going to be crowdfunding three books. (laughs) Um, The first book is the core book, The Between. That is the the sapphire blue one. And that is a revised and significantly expanded version of the original release from 2021. We are changing a few of the core rules to be a little tighter and work slightly differently based off of our years now of playtesting and trying it out. So we're going to change some of the core mechanics of the game. We are going to change how the campaign structure works a little differently. We haven't talked about the mastermind yet, but the campaign arcs orbit around these characters called the masterminds, these criminal masterminds who are pulling the strings behind the scenes. The core book comes with one mastermind, Theodore Brathwaite, but we're going to change how that works slightly. So we're changing the mastermind rules a little bit just to make the game a little bit more tighter, a little more focused. And then we're changing some of the core playbooks, particularly some of the core moves and some of the core playbooks to be, again, a little tighter just to give a better result in play. So Revising the rules, expanding the book significantly, a lot of stuff that used to just live on printouts and handouts is going to be in the actual book. Much more artwork, full color art, and quite a lot more of it is going into this book. And so the original digital release of The Between was 174 pages, and this new edition is going to be 250 pages. We're adding a lot more keeper advice. It's just like I said, it's the best, fullest version of the game. This core game is enough to play the game for one whole season, one whole campaign arc. You get the six playbooks plus the orphan, so seven. You get those core playbooks. You get the original 10 threats, which were included in the digital game, plus an 11th threat, The King in Shadows, written by... Myself, yes, Alex hello. Rubitsky, <laughs> yes. And then The Mastermind. That's what you get in the core book. It's more than enough to play a full campaign of the game. Yeah. The second book is Shadow Society. And this is just more. Shadow Society is going to have another mastermind, Admiral Flag. It's going to have a number of new threats, uh, about 10 to 12 more threats. Two more playbooks, The Legacy and The Unquiet. And then it's going to have a section of the book that is about Hargrave House itself. Now, here's the thing that even for people who know the between really well, this is the big new thing. So in the past, Hargrave House has just been this place where the characters live and work. And we see it a little bit, like we occasionally explore Hargrave House and what it's all about, but we don't go into it into too much detail. Shadow Society is going to have a lot more information about the actual house, about Hargrave House itself. What that looks like is there will be a little bit of lore. We're not going to get too heavy handed with the lore of Hargrave House. But what's really going on there is we are changing the way it works in terms of gameplay. So if you want to play a second campaign arc of the between, if you want to go fight Admiral Flagg after you've defeated Theodora or vice versa, it's Hargrave House. 
that keeps growing, that keeps developing. Your characters can also, they typically last one campaign arc, but we're kind of building in some things so that they have a little bit more survivability between campaigns. But the main thing that carries on between campaigns is Hargrave House itself. As you unlock certain rooms in Hargrave House, you get access to new abilities. You have new resources, essentially, as you explore Hargrave House more. As you unlock side character rewards in the game, they join you at Hargrave House, and they become residents of Hargrave House themselves. And so Hargrave House becomes its own thing. It sort of grows. And so that's what that part of Shadow Society, that section of the book, is about Hargrave House and exploring Hargrave House mechanically, narratively, and to be the thing that carries on between campaigns. And so Shadow Society, more London, more Hargrave House, (laughs) essentially. And now book three is the one I'm definitely most excited about. You want to explain that one? Yeah, the third book is Sons of Another World, S-U-N-S, Sons of Another World. This book leaves London completely and presents essentially three brand new games, but three brand new frameworks for the between. Those are Ghosts of El Paso, Unsinkable, and Court of Wolves. Ghosts of El Paso is something we've already published, but we're going to be revising it and putting it in this new book. Ghosts of El Paso is about the township of El Paso in the late 1800s. And essentially, every six years, this red moon, this bullet wound in the sky appears and causes ghosts to appear in town, in the surrounding area. And you play a group of people in the community who are tasked with dealing with these ghosts every six years. It has... A whole new set of playbooks, a whole new set of threats, and a new mastermind, Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds, who are quite monstrous. That's the arrangement for all of these uh, new settings in Sons of Another World is yeah. new playbooks, new mysteries, and new threats, and new masterminds. Yeah, yeah. It's just like a whole brand new game, essentially. You name drop two more. Do you want to touch on those briefly? Yeah, I do. Well, so I should say that Ghost of El Paso was co-authored by myself and Daniel Qualls. Unsinkable is by Wesley Franks. And Unsinkable is about a transatlantic journey on a big cruise ship between London and New York. Very much like Titanic ocean liner. Ocean liner kind of thing, yeah. Uh, Or that Netflix show, 1899. Yes. This takes place at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. And I don't want to get to it too much, Mm -hmm. but the Mm -hmm. basic idea is the mastermind is trying to sacrifice the passengers of the ship to a dark chthonic god in the ocean and the player characters will ultimately have to figure out how to stop that but in the meantime because of what is going on on this ship they're having to also contend with all these other eldritch horrors and so it's a sort of eldritch horror version of the between that takes place on a ship and then finally court of wolves that's the one i have talked about probably the least Uh, i think people are gonna like it this is authored by me and it takes place at versailles both the village of and the palace in the time of Louis XIV, you play essentially the security forces, for lack of a better way of putting it, of Louis XIV trying to stop people trying to topple his reign. But what you're really trying to stop ultimately is the Moon King. So Louis XIV is the Sun King, and in the fiction of Court of Wolves, he has Uh, brother (laughs) that he hid away man in the iron mask style who is now back calling himself the moon king the moon king has allied himself with a bunch of werewolves and satanists and decadent french nobles and you have to contend with those people court of wolves will be slightly unique from the others in the sense that at some point the player characters will have to make a choice do we keep serving sun king or do we now serve the moon king oh that's fun i like that so those are the three games in sons of another world nice And that's just the books alone. And there's other materials that are going to be advertised for the campaign in terms of various stretch goals and other little pledges and gifts and goodies. Well, so those are the three books as they're currently conceived. Assuming we raise enough money, we have other achievements that are lined up, Mm -hmm. new threats, new masterminds, possibly brand new games for Sons of Another World, brand new campaign frameworks. New playbooks. New playbooks. Oh, yeah. lots, Lots of new playbooks. We have a lot of stuff planned. But it will depend on hitting our achievements. Yeah. But even if we hit no achievements, you're still getting an incredible product in the three books that we've got. Yeah. Stretch goals notwithstanding, there are other gifts and goodies that you've uh, had planned and things on the side. We have one other thing planned for the campaign. Yeah. That is the... The name is pending, if I'm being honest. But right now, I'm calling them Mm -hmm. the Mastermind Dice. Sure. The Mastermind Dice are 12 
d6s, four colors of dice, three of each, so 12 total dice. They're in a collectible box. They're in this really beautiful little magnetized box. And these dice are the color of the game's masterminds. Sapphire blue for Theodora, amethyst purple for Admiral Flag, and then two others, which are connected to achievements. But in any case, we've got these four sets of three dice in one box. And what's really fun about these dice, they're beautiful on their own, but much like the game, they have a night phase. (laughs) And so these dice glow in the dark (laughs) as well. That's them. I would ask you the thing you're most excited for in this whole campaign is, but the fact that you're as giddy as a kid on Christmas (laughs) talking about these dice paints a very clear picture. I almost named the night phase dice. (laughs) Our mock-up, which we have a mock-up of them. They're beautiful. The mock-up says gemstone dice. I don't think we're going to stick with that, but I think we're going to end up calling them the mastermind dice. But in any case, yeah, they're dice with the night phase, which is pretty exciting. (laughs) (laughs) For those tables who want to play their night phase completely by candlelight in the dark. I will will say on that reward, there's not going to be an unlimited number of those. We're only making Mm. a certain number of them. As of this recording, I have not settled on that number yet, but there'll be plenty if you get in on the campaign fairly early. So uh, you'll want to make sure you back fairly early to have the best shot at getting one of those. But yeah, that's basically the idea. I will talk about the pledge tiers. I think that's important for people who are listening. Yeah, I was about to ask. We basically have a $30 tier that's all digital. So you get all three of the books in digital form, plus any digital rewards that are unlocked during the campaign for 30 bucks. The MSRP of that would be 45, so you're saving $15 there. But $30 digital only. If you add $10 to that, you also get the hardcover edition of The Between. If you go to 70, you get The Between and Shadow Society. And so there you're getting digital plus two books for 70. And so you actually save a little bit of money on the books that way. If you go up to 90, you get the Between, Shadow Society, Sons of Another World, and the PDFs, which I think is a really great deal. It's a fantastic deal for the Yeah, because content. MSRP, yeah. the books are going to be like $40 each, and so you're saving quite a lot of money off MSRP by doing that. The highest tier is the one that comes with the dice. That's going to be $125. You get the three books, digital, plus the collector's dice. And... The MSRP savings on that, if you were to, well, it's kind of a weird thing because the dice are not going to be available in retail, but if we did make them available to retail, you're saving in total something like, it's like over $100 if you get this tier, if, if you were to buy everything separate, like it would cost you like $100 more. So a really, really good deal at that higher level, but that higher level is not going to be unlimited. There's only going to be a certain number of those. So the sooner you get in, the better. So this is going to be coming out on September 24th. There is a pre-launch page that listeners, I believe, will have the link in the show notes. You can follow that. And that is if you want to get there right out of the gate. And especially with these rewards in mind, the sooner you pledge, the sooner you're out there, the better. If we can have a strong start, we know that we'll be able to unlock achievements as well. Yeah. Because there are more masterminds than just Admiral Flag and Theodora. There are more extra playbooks beyond the Legacy and the Unquiet. There is a lot of material in this game. There's lots of stuff that is completely unseen by anyone. We have a lot of secret stuff that no one's ever seen. I'm really excited Mm -hmm. to get that out there to folks. But we have to have a strong start and we have to start unlocking the goals. If that helps paint a picture of confidence for any listeners who are interested in backing this but just want a little bit more assurances, it's there is a very concrete amount of stuff that exists beyond the initial scope. Like what you're getting from the default page is a lot of content, but it really is scratching very little of the actual surface of what already exists and what we're expanding on. And it's all the more reason and incentive to back because there is so much more that we not only want to do with the between, but we have done with the between and want to take it a step further. I want to bring to the whole experience. Well, to be clear, we published a lot of stuff that is not immediately in these new books. And the reason why is because we're having to revise everything. Everything has to get a revision, has to get updated. And so that's why we've set some of those things as achievements so that we have the money and incentivization to do that and space and page count. But there's a lot of brand new stuff too. We've got, I'll just give a little yeah. tiny preview. Oh. We have a fantastic new playbook. It's by Alexi Sargent that's inspired by the Artful Dodger archetype. And they have as their nemesis a dragon. 
they are like a thief character who's trying to infiltrate the quote-unquote horde of this dragon, this worm-type character that exists in the setting. It's super, super cool. We have a Lies of P Pinocchio-style character by Jack Hargreaves. We have an Alice in Wonderland-style character. There's a lot of stuff we have planned that no one's ever seen, and it's really, really exciting. But in order to get it in the books, we got to raise enough money. <laughs> so, so, so that's the main thing. So yeah, yeah. please exactly. go, go support the game. <laughs> Well, Jason, this has been a fantastic conversation about the between mechanics and much like the rewards themselves, only really scratching the surface of what the game has to offer. And if uh, listeners, if you are interested in knowing more about the between and, and more of its component parts in a bit more depth than we have explored, I highly recommend you go check out Jason and I's podcast, The Darken Threshold, mm-hmm. available wherever you listen to your podcasts, mm-hmm. where we pick apart and explore the mystery and horror genre as it relates to the between and various sibling systems, Public Access, Brindlewood Bay, the Siltverses, and beyond. Jason, thank you so much for sitting down and having this conversation. Is there anything else you wanted to throw out there to the listeners who are excited or considering pledging to the crowdfunding campaign? Well, I mostly just want to say thanks to our supporters and specifically to the Gauntlet and to you specifically, because the between, I conceived of it in 2018, I shepherded it to completion in 2021 and all that stuff. It is my game in that sense, but the between has really, really gone beyond that. And there are so many people who play this game and who love this game. Obviously, people in the gauntlet do, but even beyond the gauntlet, there are so many communities and groups of people who are playing this game and doing their own thing with it. And I just want those people to know that this is why I get up every day, right? <laughs> like, this is why I get up every day and do this because I love knowing that something that I helped create is bringing so much joy to people and is so exciting for people. And so I just want to thank everybody who's played The Between and who loves The Between and who is ready for this next step of The Between. We absolutely could not have gotten here without you and trust that I see you and I, and I'm very, very grateful and excited by your support over the years. And to you too, Alex, as well. I mean, like, you know, we've been doing Dark and Threshold together. You've gotten involved in the editorial aspects of this. You've run the game many, many times. And you are the other credited author in the main book because of King and Shadows. David Morrison is also credited as a writer in the book because he helped write some of the unseens. But that's all just to say that you have increasingly become like so, so important to what the between is. And I just want to acknowledge that right now and thank you for all the work you've done, not just on the game, but also in the community aspect of it as well. I am honored to have been a part of it. So thank you very much for those kind words. Listeners, if you want to check out the between as a game and see it in play, you have some really fantastic resources to do so. Not only does Jason have a YouTube channel, Jason Cordova, that he posts playthroughs of his various campaigns and one shots and in community game experiences too Mm -hmm. with several between campaigns complete already on there that you can listen to Mm -hmm. we are also currently in partnership with the folks over at ain't slayed nobody doing a fantastic run of the between with phenomenal players jason is currently running it and we highly recommend checking out that it is not only a great game with great players the production value is through the roof it is an hour per episode it's extremely accessible very digestible and it really showcases the character possibility that you can get from this game so please check that out ain't slayed nobody available wherever you get your podcasts as well also, the 2021 version of the game is free yeah. right now. So if you just go to the Backer Kit page, you can download it if for free. If all of this has yeah. sounded yeah. fantastic to you, <laughs> like, great. We have excellent news you, for you. Yeah, you can get the original edition, the zeroth edition, if you will. You can get that totally free. All of that core stuff we talked about before, yeah. it's free. You can go grab it right now and start playing with your friends. Mm-hmm. Jason, thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, thanks for doing it, Alex. And thank you, listeners. We hope to see you when The Between launches on Backer Kit September 24th. Take care. Take care.